We hope you've been enjoying our print on demand series, and we really have a lot more to share with you about that. But print on demand is a great way to get your R on products without a lot of upfront costs. But we want to take a short break from this series and talk about another way to get your art and products made without investing a whole lot of your money up front. As artists and designers, many of us are interested in finding ways to get our artwork on products in the world. Rather than waiting for the perfect collaboration with a company, you can actually create those opportunities yourself with crowdfunding. It can be very confusing where to even start with something like a Kickstarter campaign. So today we're going to talk to someone who has done just that. Jenny Cowell created a Kickstarter to fund her self-care adventure cards, which she was able to not only fully fund, but actually to get three times more than she was asking for. Wow. We're really excited to learn more about that process, her stardust journey, and the advice that she can give to others who are just getting started. Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small, actionable steps, and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Jenny Cole is a multi-passionate visual artist and personal development coach specializing in self-care and creative exploration. She's the founder of Anytime Creative and offers a variety of life coaching services, mindfulness tools, and self-care support. Jenny's mission is to help scattered and multi-passionate creatives use self-care to fuel their creative expression, get out of their own way, and spend more time in flow. Jenny, welcome to the Stardust Society. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so happy. We are so excited that you're here because all of the things that you help creatives with, we need and we know our listeners need to. <laughs> yes, for sure. We like to start all of our interviews by asking you to tell us your stardust story. Um, I know that you started with photography and design, and now you're working on creative coaching and self-care and creating products like your self-care adventure cards. So give us some background. Which came first? Um, how did one lead to the other? How did you get to where you are now? Okay, I can start with when I was born. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> but truly, though, I'm, I'm the last of four kids. So there was always a lot going on in my house. And one of those things was creative activities. So my sister is a fine artist. She went to school for that, but now she does bakery pastries and cakes and stuff. Definitely an art to that. Yes, she could make anything. So in, in that shadow, I was trying to find my way. And I, you know, I always loved drawing and painting, but was never like that good. And um, then when I went to school, I was in for design and I liked that, but I wasn't like passionate about it for like a career. And I decided to do photography because it was more fun and we got to go outside. So with, <laughs> <laughs> with both of those kind of together, I felt like I had this kind of arsenal of like, you know, I could get any job or I could really create you know, a magazine, for example. Yeah. So with that, I just sort of unfolded and learned other processes like, you know, cyanotype with photography, like printmaking. And I love collaging. So that's one of my <laughs> favorite things to do as well. And in the process of just realizing that I didn't want to be one thing, like I'm not just a photographer. Like if I don't have a camera, does that mean I'm still a photographer? You know, anything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, after college, I kind of just let it roll and realized that I could do pretty much anything I wanted to. And creativity wasn't about like the actual physical, you know, end piece. It was about enjoying the journey, whether it was, you know, hiking and taking photos or making a short video or just having like some art made that I post on Instagram. And I really truly found myself, I would say like later twenties to realize that it wasn't about the medium itself. And that's kind of where anytime creative was born out of. 
Wow. And to actually understand that by your late 20s is early to me. I don't know, Nikki, uh, about you, but uh, hey, don't get us started again about how old we are. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, Jenny, I would say that figuring that out at that age is is great. So you got you went to school and you studied photography and design or you studied photography. I studied design mostly in high school and then okay. college. They let us kind of take take two years to figure out what we wanted. And then I was like, nice, I'm going to do photography and <laughs> stuck with that. Um, OK, so yeah. when you got out of school, what was the first thing you did professionally? So I actually lived in Alaska my first year out of college oh, for a I summer. Love Alaska. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So right near Denali National Park, my aunt and uncle had nice. a bed breakfast and I was a rafting photographer. So they had a lot of <gasps> uh, people going down the rapids and you'd catch them, you know, right in mid action <laughs> splash. How fun is that? <laughs> yeah. And that was like my first official job out of college and it was just for a summer, but you know, Alaska in the summer. Oh, Alaska in the summer is amazing. Yes, yes. Highly recommend You it. couldn't pay me enough to go there in the winter, but summer. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so what was next for you? Um, so then I'm, I lived in Philly for a while. I moved back and then I got a job or actually I didn't get a job. I moved to Oregon because I had a friend there from Alaska. She had a room for me. And because Oregon. <laughs> yes. Uh, so <laughs> since it, it wasn't as far as Alaska, but it still had mountains. And I moved mm -hmm. there and just started applying for Craigslist jobs. And I got a job as an instructional designer, which meant more dealing with like curriculums to make online courses. Oh, interesting. Which mm. then just really turned into being a graphic designer and making the marketing pieces for these thought leaders to make courses. <laughs> That's some really good experience, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I learned a lot. Yeah, it's great. It's great background to use for everything else that you've done since. Exactly. Like now everyone has an e-course and I, I'm making my own. Right. And it really has changed in the last eight years where it's like become so accessible to make a course. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, it probably Re, like opened me up the best because I realized like that there's actually people making money just on ideas now. <laughs> All right. So you were um, working with the online course creators. You were doing graphic design. What came next? OK, so after moving away from Oregon, just because it was a little too far away from my family, in New Jersey, I I went to Europe for six weeks. That was really fun because that's not farther away. <laughs> my my friend got married. <laughs> That's a good excuse to stay for a little while and yeah. travel around. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I will say that the idea for Anytime Creative was born in Oregon and I kind of put it on a shelf like I just had all this excitement about it. And then when I moved away, you know, your life just changes so much drastically. And I live with my parents again. So it wasn't until I moved out a couple years later that I was like, oh, yeah, this idea for a business um, was really mm -hmm. what was the initial idea that got you excited when you were still in Oregon? So it's still the core of it today, which is really just helping creatives um, stay motivated and unstuck. Mm -hmm. And I had ideas for courses or workshops and stuff like that. And when I restarted it, it be just became like my LLC for graphic design doing freelance. And I was like, oh, this still works. It's still a creative agency. Okay. And yeah, definitely. I pretty much worked freelance right after I came home to Jersey, got a job at another graphic design agency. And um, once I quit there, I took a two month road trip throughout the U.S. So there's a trend here. Yeah. I couldn't keep quitting my jobs to travel, so I needed to have my own business. <laughs> a job that could travel with you. Yes. So that road trip, um, I sold postcards from the road. Like I basically said, I'm going to these, I don't know, eight or 10 states. You can choose where you want it. I got one. Oh, yeah. Nikki did get one. Do you remember which state? <laughs> oh, man, you're telling on me now. That's It I was don't. a long time ago. It's OK. I don't. It was a few years. Yeah. Wait, so you created, you designed the postcards to sell for each of the places that you were going to? So they were just photographs of the place. So oh, awesome. it was okay. kind of a pre-sale. So in the Kickstarter mm -hmm. vein, just on my website, and it was like, hey, buy a postcard. I'll, t I'll send you any picture that I feel like, and it'll be from the state that you choose, or I will pick one for you. 
So it was very much random. I think I let you choose one for me, but I thought that was such a brilliant idea, a, a way to get, I mean, it probably didn't pay for your whole trip, but a way to supplement a little bit by by selling something in advance, which definitely is a great precursor to the Kickstarter. Exactly. Yeah. And I think everyone loves getting mail. So it was a perfect idea. Mm -hmm. And since then, um, the the self-care part kind of kicked in. So the road trip was kind of difficult being alone on the road or I would be visiting friends that I you know, used to live with in Oregon or they have all scattered across the West. And I'm mm -hmm. an introvert and it's like you're either spending too much alone time or not enough alone time at all. <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, when you're traveling, you're seeing people that you haven't seen. So it's like the same questions over and over again. Right. And I, I, I love it, but it really caused burnout. Yeah. So how long was this trip? It was two months. Two months. OK. Yeah. So when I got back after that was when I was like, OK, I'm going to work for myself. I'm going to restart Anytime Creative. And after that, when the pandemic started, I had already been enrolled in a life coaching certification, but it wasn't mm -hmm. until like I lost my main client in the pandemic because they were a restaurant and they were like mm, not no. <laughs> in the best position. Yeah. So um, that really started the self-care adventure cards, which is the Kickstarter that I did last year. OK, so tell us how you even start. So I've seen Kickstarter campaigns before, but it's like just, you know, getting the idea and then actually getting started and getting it all out there, coming up with tiers. I mean, there's like all these things that go into it. So tell us a little bit about your first experience. OK, well, also, before you do that, before you even got to the Kickstarter, tell us about the development of the idea for the product in the first place. OK, so for the cards, I really just created them out of necessity for myself. So I love checklists, you know, it, it keeps me motivated, but with self-care, it wasn't like something I felt needed a checklist. I didn't want to like sit there and check off that I meditated or, you know, went for a walk. Right. So I created little self-care squares, I called them. And one, they were probably like two inch by two inch. One side was a self-care prompt, like drink tea, like very simple one thing. And then the other side was an affirmation. So you know, like I'm nourishing myself or something kind of related to the prompt. Mm -hmm. So I like this idea, but I felt like it couldn't really like you'd need a lot of cards to sell them to people because not everyone has the right. same interests as me. <laughs> so I think one day, like I just had this idea and I was locked up with my boyfriend in my parents' house because, you know, March 2020, <laughs> we don't have to say uh -huh. Like what we're all doing then, but <laughs> right. somehow between the, you know, watching the news and trying to like figure stuff out, I was like, OK, let's figure out how these cards could really look. And what transformed was that it was only going to be like 50 or 60 cards, but the cards had more prompts on them and they were all kind of mm -hmm. themed like, you know, isolate could mean like meditate or close the door or really, you know, go for a walk in the woods, like something where the the theme of the card was listed on the top, but you could take that as you want or keep going further into the prompts itself. Very cool. Yeah. So tell us how you went from, OK, I have this idea. I have I have this deck of cards, which, by the way, they're beautifully designed. And um I'm a design snob and I don't think most things are beautifully designed. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen them, You're I've seen them online. I don't have a physical version of them, but they are beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I wonder which box they're packed in <laughs> <laughs> since I just moved, but, um, they're beautifully designed. But so how did you go from having this idea and you had them designed to, okay, now how am I going to get these things made? OK, yeah. So a lot of the question was production and how to get mm -hmm. them made. And luckily, I was in a um, a group of entrepreneurs called Unreal Collective. Um, it's since been changed to Smart Passive Income. But in there is like a Kickstarter kind of company. So they help you basically make your product and market it and produce it. Oh, nice. That is awesome. So this company is called Product Refinery, 
and it, it's all in the name. Like I had, I had an idea and they helped me refine it. Oh, so, that's brilliant. Yeah. We will definitely have to link to that info in the show yes. notes. So I, I can, I wouldn't be here without them because I knew I had this idea that was bigger than, you know, I could get a card deck printed, but it, I had more ideas basically. So it's not just a card deck. There's a card cloth, which Nikki has used as a dog bandana. Um, I have. Rocket <laughs> loves it. <laughs> so a lot of people say, what is what is this? Um, but the card cloth, if you ever pull tarot cards, you have like a sacred space to pull your cards. Or if mm-hmm. you want to bring just the cards along, you can wrap them up and, you know, just it's like a little bandana. It keeps them safe. Yep. And then there's also a little wood block that says I am enough. And you put the card in there if you want to you know, leave it there for the day or come back to it and remember which card that you pulled. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And then, yeah, I've done, I've used that on my desk, sitting on my desk. So I'm reminded during the day of, Hey dummy, take care of yourself. (laughs) (laughs) But back to how you started getting it um, produced when you started working with this company, did you have the design done or was it still in the idea phase? Yeah, it was pretty much in the idea phase. And we started, Okay, I want to say we started in June and then we launched in August. So it was like a short term Mm kind of high, high velocity project. And yeah, for sure. um, Working with them, we were really able to craft all the extra pieces in the box and the use cases. Like there's a guidebook with it to make sure that you know what you're doing with the cards. And Mm -hmm. what was also born was that it had um, five areas of self-care. So first, my cards didn't have any rhyme or reason. It was just kind of like prompts. And Mm -hmm. just like a board game might have is like different little categories. So I we together, we came up with um, the idea of having categories. And then I created the five areas of self-care are um, revitalize, nourish, express, connect, and reflect. Nice. So that will be labeled on the cards. They have little icons and they're all color coded. They're all color coded and it's a beautiful color palette. (laughs) (laughs) So really with that being said, like the cards, the creating of the cards was the easiest part. And I'm Mm -hmm. not an illustrator, but I went on creative market and I got a set of illustrations. Ah, So it's royalty free. So I am allowed to do that. And um, everything else I made you know, just came from this branding system I created for the deck and Mm -hmm. the Kickstarter launched. It's like end of August, but I started marketing it probably end of July to talk, to tell people that it was coming. So when you were starting to market it, did you have a sample in your hands or were you just kind of telling people what was coming? Yeah. So I did get a sample of the cards from this company called makeplayingcards.com. And they sent like Mm -hmm. a single, a single order of the cards so I could play with them. And then I also sent out some to friends to sample them and give me reviews about them. Mm -hmm. And, and is that who made the final cards, the final deck? No. So actually it was another company in China and they have a minimum order of a thousand. So hence the Kickstarter. Ooh, Ooh, that's a scary number. Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But I like that. I like what you're saying, um, Jenny, is that you you got the sample, you know, domestically, you got a sample, people could touch it, feel it, kind of look at it, the designs, does it work for them? And then you would potentially have the opportunity to tweak it before you went and ordered like a thousand of them. And did you? Did I order a (laughs) thousand? No. Did you actually change the design after the first um initial samples or yeah I, based on feedback i definitely changed the first ones because they didn't have the five areas and then the second right. ones i think i added more after that so i kept ordering them and then mm-hmm. i got one sample from the final company and um they said at first this was without all of the extra pieces that i was going to throw in there so it was mm-hmm. a smaller box and then I I didn't see the final sample until like after the Kickstarter was done. (laughs) And did the company that you worked with, what were they called? Refinery? Product Refinery. Product Refinery. Um, Did they help you source the manufacturer? Yes. Yes. Nice. Awesome. Nice. Because it was more than one factory to put it all together. (laughs) 
is it also like a booklet that comes with the cards or some directions that come with the cards on how to use them? Yeah, there's like a f- eight to 10 page guidebook that kind of talks about the use cases for the deck and the five areas of self-care. And there's also five reflection bookmarks in there too, which was a stretch awesome. goal on Kickstarter, which we can talk about later. Um, so those, I didn't want to make a journal cause that would have kind of caused more shipping problems for me at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, let me just do bookmarks. Anyone can put them wherever and they're easy and fun. But maybe a journal is an upcoming product. Yes. Um, now that I have more, uh, (laughs) means to produce that, I can definitely make a journal and figure out what I want to put in there too. Very cool. So we talked about like the thousand minimum order. And I think that's one of the things for product based businesses that so many people are scared about. It's like, I don't want to end up with a a thousand things in my garage if I can't sell them. So I think that's kind of the beauty of Kickstarter a little bit is that you can kind of get a taste for do I have the demand? Are there enough people that, you know, orders that would be placed to, to hit that that threshold or that goal? Right. Yeah. Um, And you don't have to pay all the money up front. You can wait until you have the money to spend to then turn around and and pay your supplier, or, you know, the person that's going to create them for you. Right. Yeah, because we've been talking about print on demand lately. And so that's another way to go, which is kind of what you did with your sample pieces. It was like a print on demand sort of thing. But you're not going to you're not going to make a whole lot of profit if you do it that way. You're not going to have, you know. You're not going to have as much of a, a business with that as if you were able to reach your, you know, thousand minimum. So Kickstarter was your way of doing that. Yes. So I thought about all those avenues and mm-hmm. I would say the more you order, the cheaper it gets. So if I ordered right. 5,000, you know, cut the profit or the cut the cost itself in half, but I would still have to pay out of pocket. Um But with the Kickstarter, I was able to like reach that goal basically to cover production. And then that meant that everything, you know, there were still other costs in marketing and, and, you know, paying a consultant company. But after after I had them in my hands, you know, it's all quote unquote profit. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the question about stock in your garage, it's definitely a concern. Uh, Luckily, Product Refinery at first, they they have a hookup with a warehouse that's shipping things. And I was able to kind of park my stuff there for the beginning and they would, you know, get an order. It would all be hooked up through the back end and ship it for me. So there are companies that will ship your stuff for you (laughs) if you don't have the means. Yeah. Like drop shipping, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to have them in a single location. Um, But it came down to it that I wanted to pursue more like wholesale routes or, you know, just, I had the room at my parents' house and I just bought a bunch of boxes to my house in Nashville. So um, luckily I don't have all of them like because I sold half of them at least, but it's been easier to manage now that I kind of got in the groove of, you know, printing out a shipping label. (laughs) (laughs) So let's dig into the Kickstarter. Sure. How do you even start? (laughs) (laughs) Starts with an idea. (laughs) idea check so i will be honest this wasn't my first kickstarter so i had experience Ah. i did two in college okay do you want to give us just a little brief background about what those were yeah the first one was when i was studying abroad in europe i I needed money and i wanted to make a photo book so i raised five thousand dollars uh my junior year of college to go travel abroad in rome and anywhere else that it brought me and um, nice. I was able to make a photo book and send out prints to whoever donated. I actually visited one of the supporters, backers in Belgium. So he was like, hey, I love what you're doing. If you're ever in Belgium. That's so, super cool. I uh, became friends with him and his family. And then um, in senior year, we actually just had a project, which was to create a video for a Kickstarter and I think I was the only one to actually make it live. So I <laughs> that's awesome. Everyone else didn't complete the project, but I just raised money for my final um, senior thesis art show for photo frames, basically. And through those experiences, I kind of understood the power of it through getting mm-hmm. your friends to donate and family. Yeah. But I had never truly done it in this fashion where 
you know, I don't want just my family pity donating to this project because I think <laughs> some of us have that thought. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but what was nice about that is that you kind of got to flex your courage muscle a little bit because you mentioned before that you're an introvert mm -hmm. and and I am as well. And so sometimes putting yourself out there can and asking for something feels difficult. And so that was a great way to get started with those first two Kickstarter campaigns you did because it kind of helped break through the resistance and get started. And yeah, I was not an expert, but I at least understood like the little bits and pieces of like the Kickstarter page and how a user might go through the process. Well, you've now done three successful Kickstarter campaigns. So I'm going to say that you're kind of an expert. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Way more that. than an expert than the other two people on this. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay, so when you get on Kickstarter, um, people have like tiers, right? You can set up tiers of, so with one tier, you get a certain thing. With another tier, you get another, you know, enhanced version of it. So how did you decide what to do for that? So I was advised not to get too crazy with the tiers as far as like, you know, some people throw in T-shirts and stickers and extra mm -hmm. things. I think that's totally fine, especially if you're making a movie or it just kind of depends on the medium where you want to get people yeah. hyped. But for mine, right. it was kind of like, I just want to make a box of that has cards in it and other fun stuff. So the tiers became um, like early bird backers could get like the lowest price. And then you mm -hmm. could get basically two like a buddy pack and then you can get four for family pack so the tiers just became like a discounted bundle the more that you bought together yeah okay yeah and then i think do you you also have a wholesale tier in there yeah there was one for Did like you, 10 which would be like yeah. the wholesale um yeah but normally wholesale can vary like right now i just sell four as wholesale <laughs> but it's it when you're starting the kickstarter it's like you get to make the rules but you can always add tiers and then you can like have limits on them. So if you only want like 50 people to buy the first like lowest early bird, then that'll sell out and then it'll go into the next kind of level that's available. So let me ask you this. I'm just curious and I know we'll talk a little bit more about marketing later, I'm sure. But when you started this, did you have a fairly large following on social media or you wanted to put this out in the world? And when you're just getting started, I think a lot of people go, I can't do this because I don't have enough followers. Yeah, I I wouldn't say I had a huge following. I can't remember exactly, maybe around like seven to eight hundred people on Instagram um, yep. but I really utilize my networks. So it doesn't matter that they were following me. It's just that I was able to be excited about it and share it. And then people mm -hmm. like Nikki saw it and backed it. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> Wandering Aimfully is the community that we met in. So a lot of people from there became backers and shared it with their networks. So I would say it's a lot of just trusting that other people will get excited about it, too. Yeah, and I definitely did. As soon as I saw it, I thought, I mean, I mean, I'm a sucker for good design, even if it's not something that I would normally be drawn to. <laughs> so I I'm I'm very good at neglecting self-care, <laughs> but I can't <laughs> neglect good design. So <laughs> so you you drew me in with that more than anything. But um, you might neglect self-care, but it doesn't mean you don't want more of it in your life. That's true. I absolutely yeah. do want more of it in my life. And so a beautifully designed deck of cards certainly helped. But I love that, that you you didn't have a huge social media following, but you had other networks that you were a part of. So I know we've talked a little bit about wandering aimfully in past episodes, I think, um, without going into a whole lot of it. It's basically it's basically a, a network of creative entrepreneurs and, you know, it's surrounding Jason and Caroline Sook and all their products that they sell. But but it's just a really great community of people who are helping each other. Yeah. And that's also what Kickstarter is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I will say. Kickstarter also has its own platform. So a lot of people did find me from Kickstarter. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just my own feed. Um, Kickstarter will recommend you products and it'll also have like 
this product or is expiring. So come check it out and maybe buy it. So you kind of get a uh, Kickstarter on your side. And I, I was able to connect with a lot of great card lovers on there as well. Yeah. So I'm definitely guilty of going on Kickstarter because say I saw you promote your cards and then they recommend other things that you might be interested in. So I may have several sets of cards from different people. <laughs> That's great. Okay, I'm going to tell myself I have like an entire drawer full of cards. I love them. <laughs> I just do. I'm we're we're for card them. addicts. We're yes. card addicts. And I want to create some myself as well. So this is a great conversation for me, Jenny. Um, mine would be probably more with with paintings or illustrations on the um, on one side of them. But um, it's something that I've I've always been interested in doing as well. Yeah, it's it's super rewarding because it's tangible and it's like art you can bring around with you and you don't have to just keep it on your wall or anything and you can use it mm -hmm. to help guide your life. So did you um, have an email list at this time? Yeah, I've always had at least a, like, I don't know, a hundred or so people on my email list through mm -hmm. through the beginnings. But I did, you know, email my list. I had a Facebook group that I started to help kind of get people excited about self-care um, I did like a three day challenge. If you submitted your homework every day that you go on a group coaching call with me. So I had a few people hop on there and. Oh, that's cool. And I gave away one of the decks of cards. So I did a, a giveaway or two. So really, it now, was. How, yeah. how did those work for you? Because I've, I've heard mixed things about giveaways. Um, but you did um, you did a giveaway of your cards. Was it on Instagram or how did you do the giveaway? So mine was actually to backers only. So mm -hmm. what we called it was like the golden sample giveaway. When I first got the decks, uh, probably like last October, November, um, we did a giveaway during the campaign. So it was like, hey, go share that the campaign's ending if you are a backer. And I kept track uh -huh. of everyone who tagged me. And then um, I picked two people from there randomly that won. And then they got first access to the deck. So they were also getting their own deck later, uh, like the actual fully produced one. But this was like a sample and they got to use it. And if they wanted to talk about it and, you know, pseudo guerrilla market it, then that was great, too. That what a great way to reward people that backed you by giving them that first access. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. So the Instagram ones I didn't do until I had the actual physical deck in my hands. Um, and that was just more about getting anyone excited about it and sharing the post and then picking a random winner that way too. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit about the, more about the campaign itself. Like, um, how long did it run? Do you choose how long it runs? Do they make recommendations to you? Yeah. So generally I think you can choose like 30 to 60 days. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you can choose however many, like you could do five days, but that's not recommended. Um, yeah. But about a month is recommended because you're having to market that the whole time. And right. what I learned was like, try not to launch on a weekend, which is general launching, <laughs> um, you know, 101 and not ending on like a weekend or Friday. Okay. So look at the time frame and say, okay, I have like 28 days, Tuesday to Tuesday. And then. And is that what you did? I think I did like a Tuesday and then ended on a Wednesday. Okay. Um, to try, And then it wasn't at like mid, I don't know what time I said it really, but I, I was trying to market it until the end, but you really, right. you go hard in the first couple of days, the first week. And then there's generally a lull because the excitement wears off. And then at the end, it's kind of like, hey, last chance to get in. And you'll see like an uptick of sales then. That always happens at the very end. Yeah. Um, where I, I know if I think about me being a purchaser, I'm like one of those persons that always like buys at the very, very end of something because I'm trying to decide because I overthink everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then at the very end, I'm like, I don't want to miss out. Fear of missing out. And then, I, then I'll, hit, <laughs> I'll hit the buy button right there on the, like, the last minute that yeah. it's available. I'll spend that month trying to talk myself out of buying it because no, you don't really need this. But then at the end, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and Kickstarter, you get to be part of this like maiden project. You know, it's really just like 
you are helping support the production of it. It's not just like buying it on the shelves. It's not as exciting. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the best things about Kickstarter and things like Patreon too, where you're not just buying a product that you like from some big store. You're supporting somebody's dream, which is just amazing. Yes. Yeah. So talk to us a bit more about how you marketed it leading up to the start of the campaign, because you said you started before it launched. Yes. And then during the campaign. Yeah, so the pre-launch is just as important as the launch itself. So you want to have people like ready to buy this as soon as the doors open. So mm-hmm. I th- we always forget that part. Yeah, I think as artists, <laughs> as artists, we can be like, I just want to go now, and and then nobody, you get crickets. So it's yeah. building <laughs> excitement. Um, I had kind of hinted at it for maybe a, a month or two before, but when it actually was like a month out, I was like, hey, I'm making this thing and here's the behind the scenes. I had Instagram polls to help people pick some color palettes and generally. Oh, that's smart. Oh, that is smart. Get people excited about helping you develop yeah, the product. Yeah, keeping people engaged. <laughs> and. I was like creating new cards in the process and I was like, do you like this one or that one? Or should I add does this? Does this need to be added? And I think when people are along the ride, like mm-hmm. if you can even tease it out, like I wouldn't say like pretend, but like maybe just leave a couple things for, you know, dripping it out of the final piece, like make people feel like they were involved and like it doesn't have to be finished as soon as the Kickstarter is over <laughs> um, because you can still kind of work on it as you go and ask for feedback. Right. Smart. Yeah. So the like I don't have like a full on pre-launch plan, but it was just a lot of taking photos of the samples, working on the, mm-hmm. the video, um, releasing little clips here and there. And then when it went live, I really, or at least the, the couple of days before, I was really talking about it. Like I said, about mm-hmm. the Facebook group, got some people mm-hmm. excited in a, in a free challenge, uh, which is a very common thing. And yep. and then really the launch week, I just remember opening the doors and DMing all day, basically, because <laughs> people were excited and I wanted to keep the momentum going. But having the DMs is awesome. And that's because you did that pre-launch work. Yes. Yes. And I remember taking a bath on launch day because I was like, I just need to be be alone for a minute and decompress. <laughs> is that one of your self-care cards? Yes. Go take a bath? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> that's the one that Nikki keeps in her holder on her desk all the time. That is the one that I keep. You know that the apartment that I'm living in right now has no bathtub? Oh, that's sad. Oh, I yeah. know. Very sad for Nikki. But my school bus is going to have one. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We have a beautiful garden bathtub here. It's the best part of this apartment. So <laughs> that nice. is my savior. Um, and really what came down to it was like, there's only so much you can do is like you do the pre-launch, you do the day of launch, but you're still you. You still have to take care of yourself. You know, you're going to want to check the Kickstarter to see it going up and like get really excited. Um, but otherwise, like just make sure you carve out time and you're not like having a million other things to do that day. Well, yeah, because I'm sure you also had other work responsibilities and you can't just sit there on Kickstarter clicking refresh all day. <laughs> I know, even if you want to, but I would say even if you want to like, try not to go on a vacation like the week before or like you really just treat it <laughs> like this you know, two month container is, is really important to your integrity of the launch, but make sure you take breaks and have like the launch emails prepared so that really when it comes down to like the, the open door is that you're just kind of responding and pivoting, not like creating a whole sequence as you go. So what was the funding that you were looking for, for this campaign? What was your your goal? Uh, like 50,000. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> that was like my, oh my God goal. Like that would be great. Um, the goal for it to kind of launch and like really be real. I was like 4,000 was my lowest goal. 
Um, and was that like what it would cost to get your thousand minimum? No, it was just it was just the cost that it would take for it to really happen. So I could still make it work. OK, but I needed really I just wanted that to get funded quickly. And then right. it would build trust with the audience that'd be like, oh, it's actually happening. Um, so that is kind of something could be a little misleading. But once you're once you have the funding fully funded, you you got to go with it. And I would say like my internal goal was around like 16,000 just to have everything covered. But I believe mm-hmm. it was about 12,000. And that was perfect for me to cover the cost of the cards and everything. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, Mm -hmm. if your goal was 4,000 and you got 12,000, I mean, Laura, you do the math. (laughs) Yeah, that that's three times what you wanted. (laughs) Um, I think that's pretty stinking awesome. Yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. The original mount, do you have, don't you have to publish that on Kickstarter? Do you have to like put it up there saying this is what I'm going for this amount? Yeah, that's the that's the like the meter kind of for it. like it will say, oh, you're at 100 percent, you're at 200 percent and it'll keep okay. going up. So if I had set it like at 20K and I only made 4K the first day, it would have been like, oh, I'm only like less than 25 percent there. So right. it doesn't look as sexy on on Kickstarter. Well, also with Kickstarter, you only get the money if you get the amount. Yes. If it's fully funded. Right. Mm-hmm. I know there are other platforms that, okay, I haven't even looked at it in years, but it used to be um, Indiegogo was one that you could still get the money if you didn't get the whole amount. Yeah. Oh, okay. Does it refund people on Kickstarter if you don't, if you don't hit that amount or something? Yeah. It never even charges their card until you. Yeah. It doesn't take the money until you reach the amount. Oh, But if you go over what you did, then yay. Yep. (laughs) So there must be some strategy there in picking your amount because you knew that to get it fully covered, you needed more than what you asked for, but you found a number to to set as your goal that, okay, if I get this much, I can still make it happen. Yeah, that that is why I hired a consultant team, a product refinery. Yeah, to come up with what that is. Yeah. So I'm not yeah. trying to give away all their secrets, but I think that is at, like... Whether or not you're trying to come off a certain way with your amount, like it's just knowing that, yeah, you might want it to be really high, but just know that you build trust by having it be fulfilled and then you Mm -hmm. continue to market it for the month. And then people in their brains are like, oh, it's going to happen. And it's just becomes like shopping at a discount because of all the lower tiers. Yeah. So it's a different kind of psychology. Yeah. And I can definitely see how you would want somebody with experience to help you figure out, you know, yeah, what what to even ask for. Yep, I needed that. And then is it still available now? Like, can you go to your Kickstarter and purchase or does it redirect people to your website to purchase or how does that work? So once the campaign's over, you can still see it. But I have like a little button at the top that'll just say, buy now. I think I have to change it. It says pre-order. So I had put it on Indiegogo after the campaign was over to collect. Uh Um, They actually will take your Kickstarter goal and like convert it into Indiegogo. So on Indiegogo, it already said I made $12,000. And oh, that's cool. And I kept it open as like a pre-sale price until I got them on my own website. So that's kind of another secret trick. And it uh-huh. it wasn't building a lot of, you know, traction. It just was another place to purchase after the campaign, um, just at a different price because it went up. Um, yeah. So now it just links to my website and then I just sell them through. I'm using Shopify right now, but I'm probably going to switch to WooCommerce. That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, we use WooCommerce, Nikki and I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're you said you're doing all the shipping yourself now. You used to use a drop shipper at one point mm-hmm. and now you're doing all the shipping yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to say right now I'm not getting a ton of orders like a day, so it's not hard. Um, that would yep. be a goal, but it's really like an exciting thing to get an email. And then I bought myself a little Canon printer that like folds up if I need it to. I would love to get mm-hmm. one of those like you know, small printers that prints labels for shipping. The thermal printers. Yeah. Oh my God. Like a little Rolo. Those are awesome. Yes. I totally want one of those little Rolos. Yeah. 
because you can make <laughs> other stickers with that too. But I'm uh-huh. like, I can't, I need a real printer just for like adulting. And yeah. I just got, um, like Amazon had sticky half sheets of paper that you just put, run through. Mm-hmm. And um, I also got boxes created with the self-care cards. So it actually is like a branded box. And nice. I just slap the label on there and I don't have to think about finding boxes or anything. They just come in the box I ship it in. And Perfect. super great. <laughs> Very cool. So let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about self-care. Because, you know, we asked you to come here and talk about the Kickstarter product because we thought that's what our listeners might want to know more about. But we also all need to talk about (laughs) self-care. Yes. So, yeah. So tell us about like a little bit more about how you came to that and what does that look like to you? So self-care, as I touched on earlier about my road trip, like I... Mm -hmm. I was expecting to be like highly creative and inspired the whole time, but I brought my camera and I was taking pictures. I had a whole bundle of books and notebooks that I just never touched. And I found myself just like watching Netflix in my tent a lot of the times and just feeling (sighs) displaced. So I had that exact same experience when I went, I went to Mexico for three months. Oh, wow. And I brought art supplies and sketchbooks and books and thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have all this time to create. I watched a lot of Netflix, too. Yeah. (laughs) So why is that? Why do we do that? (laughs) And I think sometimes we need that. So I think I think it was Brene Brown was saying, like, her husband and kids went out of town for the weekend. She's like, I'm going to write. I'm going to write. It's going to be great. And she watched like Law and Order the whole weekend. (laughs) (laughs) It's not a bad choice. Yeah. And when they came back, she was like inspired to write again. And for me, it was that I was I quit my job, broke up with my boyfriend at the time and just like got up and went and drove for two months. And it had been my goal for a while. But when it was actually happening, I was still processing the previous time. Ah, Right. And. Self-care was never like a proponent in my life. I never thought about it. But when I got back from the road trip, I moved in to my own apartment and I was like, oh, okay, now, now I have to have like a routine and really feel good before I create. So the reason I wasn't creating was because I was just meeting my basic human needs as, you know, surviving on the road, finding healthy food. Um staying sane, (laughs) being introverted. (laughs) Um, So like that notion, it wasn't just like a buzzword anymore. It was like, oh, okay. Like this is as a creative, my key to like actually creating more. And I think they're both interchangeable. Self-care is creative and creativity is self-care, but we can be as artists can be so hard on ourselves about you know, whether it looks good or feels good or someone's feedback. So it's just become a journey in getting to know myself and realizing that a creative practice doesn't have to mean anything to anyone else except myself. And as long yeah. as not, not even as long as it's just more of a, if it feels good to write, that's going to be my outlet today. And it's, it's just about being aware of it. And that's where the shift came for me. And and everybody has a different version of self-care. It doesn't look the same for each person. Exactly. Mine is bourbon. Yeah, Nikki's is bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it could, you know, for one person, it could be just spending um, 10 minutes out in nature, you mm-hmm. know. Another person, it could be scribbling, you know, on a pad of paper, or it could be having an hour-long massage, or bourbon while having a massage. I don't know. Would that work for oh you, Nikki? Oh, my God. Why haven't I ever done that? <laughs> I think that would be so, amazing. <laughs> yeah. So self-care is something we forget. And I know um, some of our listeners may be in a situation like I am. I'm working in a full-time job and sometimes that spills into the evening. Sometimes? A lot of times. And then I'm trying to get this creative wellspring to turn around and then do my my art business, right? And so it's a little bit of burning the candle at both ends. And I'm And I love doing both things. But when you try to do all of them at once, it gets really, really, really difficult. Like the self-care thing, there isn't any room for it. Right. Um, So I get stuck in that cycle. Well, that really does make sense when you think about how 
how you go straight from that working, 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 and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to take this creative little vacation and do all this great stuff. And then you're, you're too exhausted to do it. So you do need to take care of yourself before you can do all those things that you planned. Yeah. Like we have, we have cycles. We are not going to be creative all the time. And damn it. Sorry. My company (laughs) is called anytime creative, but, (laughs) (laughs) but you really mean sometimes creative. (laughs) Yes. It, it's like a dual meaning. It's deeper. It's meaning that like if you want to be creative, like you hear some tools to help you get there. It's like I'm not teaching you how to draw or paint or any of those awesome things, but it's like I'm the companion to help you get to that place or use those modalities to move through something like, you know, doing some sort of inner work that way. So there have been times that I haven't taken a photo for three months when I was like truly a photographer. I was like, do I even Mm -hmm. call myself that anymore? And then I would pick it up and it was all normal, but it was this pressure that I put on myself and this societal pressure to be a creative and to just understand that it's like you are creative no matter what you have it inside of you. It is intangibly there. And you said creative wellspring before Laura, and we all have one inside of us. And the self-care piece is what we really helps fill it back up. So I think I've been in that position of working full time and wanting to have that creative energy, but being zapped. And even now I'm trying to run my own business. It's it's incredibly hard. But like if you look at it, the reverse, it's like, how do you make time for yourself first and then the other stuff falls in? I think that's the only swap that we can make. Otherwise, it will always come last, but we need to keep driving the, you know, the train here for ourselves. So um, I think a lot of people can relate. And it's okay to watch Netflix for a weekend. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Is it okay to do it for three months? I don't think there's any (laughs) rhyme or reason. (laughs) I think it's about acceptance and awareness, but not trying to really force ourselves out of something. And, you know, sometimes we have to feel our feelings, unfortunately, but damn it, it is more beautiful if we can. (laughs) Yeah. So that's fantastic. That's really good advice. And so talk to us about the self-care offerings that you have for people. Like, how do you how do you work with people? Wonderful. So I'm a coach or I like to call myself a creative guide. So with these self-care cards has kind of sparked this whole way of thinking about self-care and creativity. And I've created my first group program, which is called Uncover Your Creative Wellspring. Woohoo! Touching on that creative wellspring again, it's like we have this inside of us, but it might be covered up by, I like to call it like the Velcro of our lives. So we move through our life (laughs) and other people's opinions or negative words, art teachers uh, that didn't say kind things. And those types of things have been stuck in there and they're not allowing us to be our true self. So if we can peel back those layers, By using some creative practices, I like to call it like embodiment work, breath work, meditation, like journaling, vision boarding, like all these fun things, working on ourselves um, and creating boundaries so that we have that creative time and capacity that is going to be, I don't know, the, the best way for you to work with me right now, because it's a let's say like an eight to nine week program starting in January, but I'm going to be doing more of these. This is just the beginning. And what that entails too is just, um, it's going to be five group calls as well as community support. And I have some guest speakers coming in too. And it's, it's not like a group program in your normal sense. I just want it to be like a collaborative space for creatives or curious creatives to come in and, like there's so much power in when someone can hold space for you and like zoom yeah. zoom fatigue is real i know it's been a long <laughs> two years already but if we can really just like take that time for ourselves and take it back so that we're having 
I guess, a creative process happening in the background. It's not just sitting and listening. I think it's going to be really hands on and I don't know, really fun. So you're all welcome to join. And we will link to the page with the information about that in our show notes for sure. So is there anything else that we should have asked you about? What question should we have asked you that we didn't? Hmm. Good question. Um, who my favorite artist is? Sure. Yeah. Who's your favorite artist? It's me. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> So like, that's a really hard question. I don't know why you guys asked me that, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) we like to hit the hard hitting questions. I think the most influential person has been Austin Kleon who wrote steal like an artist and Austin Kleon. Oh, we've brought him up so many times and he doesn't know it yet, but he's going to be on the podcast sometime. He should be. Yes. So as soon as we work up the courage to ask him (laughs) (laughs) next week. Uh huh. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure. I have enough bourbon for that. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a person uh, who happens to create as well. He is. I mean, you know of him, but I just think when I found his book, "Steal Like an Artist," and then I think I got "Show Your Work" at like the same time, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Dang!" I just needed to hear it, and I read it probably like once every six months. But that's the kind of person I want to be. Is just like these little bites. Like I want to share creative or self-care bites and have people pick it up, put it down. It doesn't matter if I don't, you don't need to read a full book ever. It's just, um, yeah, that is to me like the creative process. And what was your biggest takeaway from either of those books that you enjoy a lot from him? Um, I, that's hard to say. I think the steal like an artist mentality is like, especially since I like to collage it and, you know, I'm taking photos yeah. of things that are already existing. It's like giving me permission that mm-hmm. I am literally just using my lens, my eyes as part of this world. And I might take a picture of a mural, but it's that someone else's work. But in my own lens, I'm able to interpret it and share that with the world. So I think art is supposed to be like the social currency and it's just really about expression and it's not, I don't think we should have it like snooty or high end all the time. I think there's a place for it, but the most of the world is never going to be in a gallery. So like make the world your gallery. Oh, I like that quote. Make the world your gallery. That's perfect. And by the way, do you get his weekly emails? Yes, they're great. They're brilliant, too. He just shares things that he's come across that fascinate him. I think this is the third time I've heard about that. So I need to go sign up for his email. You really do. Get yeah, on there. I, I mean, there are very few. I sign up for a lot of emails and unsubscribe really quickly. There are very few that I absolutely read every week. And his is one. His is one of them. Yeah. So I strive to be that good. Yes. I I want yeah. I want to create a database of like creative resources too. So that's coming up someday soon. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So the next question we have for you is what is one piece of advice that you would give to those that are just getting started? I do this all the time and it's over consuming. So if you can try to separate yourself from the imposter syndrome, from consuming everyone else's content and try to really just be the curator, like the steal like an artist mentality, try to separate and distance yourself like directly from people's work. And if this is about creating work, like if you're, you know, looking for inspiration, that's, I think that's okay. But if you're trying to build a business, really see if you can move out of that comparison trap to to knowing that people, they might be two years along, they might be 10 years along and you're just starting. So it feels really hard, but knowing yeah. that like, if you just keep creating and learning and growing, you'll get there. So I just think if we can spend more time creating than consuming, that's the best advice I can give and seek help mm-hmm. from like advisors that aren't going to kind of scare you. Like, Maybe a little bit, but like (laughs) push you outside of your comfort zone, but not throw you off the deep end. Exactly. Like figure out what you're comfortable with, but also know that like it's going to take time too. you'll get there. (laughs) More great advice. So um, 
Are there any resources that you can think of aside from Austin Cleon? <laughs> any resources that have really helped you in your creative business? Okay. So one that comes to mind is Otter is a voice transcription tool and it's an app. It's free for like 6,000 minutes a month or something. So if you want to just open up your phone and voice record yourself, like with any thoughts and ideas, um, it'll automatically transcribe it for you. So it's just otter.ai. And like, this is great for people that get ideas like on their walks or randomly in the car, because we know creative stuff comes from anywhere else besides, you know, the <laughs> the computer or the drafting table. Right. <laughs> um, so that's one that I use often. And I'm trying to think. That's actually a great one. We we use that. I use that every week to do the transcriptions for the podcast. Mm -hmm. But I have yet to use it the way that you've suggested. So I think it's great advice. Yeah. So that one um, has perfect range and you can use it for business or pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, otherwise, as far as like creative resources go, um, just go to a used bookstore <laughs> and walk around <laughs> and see what you can find and just make it a game. Like if you're looking for inspiration, I think that's like. I mean, hopefully you have one in your town, but that's where I find myself looking through the art section or the metaphysical oh, section yeah. or like, I don't know, any type of random thing that's even outside of your niche and like look into it, um, make it random and make it fun. Here in Dallas, we actually have a store called Half Price Books, and it's been here for, I don't know, 20, 25 years or more. Um, and it's grown and I think it's even in other states now, but it is the coolest. It's like a Sam size warehouse full of used books. That's awesome. Oh, wow. It is like the coolest place in the planet to go to and do that. I love it. But also, Laura, your house and my house are also <laughs> used bookstores. <laughs> we could each open one. Pretty much. Even after I sold half of the books that I own, I could yeah. still open a used bookstore. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to buy anything. Maybe go to the library, take it out, take pictures of it and yes. put it back. <laughs> I love the library. That would be smart. <laughs> All right. So, Jenny, where can our listeners find you online? So you can find me at anytimecreative.com or at anytimecreative on Instagram is where I normally hang out. And I have a newsletter, uh, it's called Creative Quest Newsletter. So send out creative and self-care inspiration every week. And yeah, you can pretty much find everything on my website. Awesome. Well, we just want to thank you for your time today. This has been so fascinating to learn more about um, Kickstarter campaigns and how those work and to learn more about self-care and all the things that Nikki and I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> all the things we're going to have to come back to you and ask you about. <laughs> Seriously, thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And I'm glad uh, I could help provide some insight. To learn more about Jenny and read today's Start a Society show notes, go to startasociety.com slash Jenny Cole, and that's spelled J-E-N-N-I-K-O-W-A-L. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to leave us a five-star rating and review. Reviews help us reach more stardusts like you and keep us inspired to continue creating new episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.